a series that we've been calling, What Next? We've been looking at the question, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when you're kind of stuck? What do you do when you find yourself in a set of circumstances and there's really no way to fix it? There's no way forward, there's no way out. That's just the way it is and the way it's going to be. And as far as you can see in the foreseeable future, nothing's going to change. For many of us, this will have to do with a relationship. Maybe you find yourself in a marriage, and it's not a great marriage, but you don't want to get divorced, but nobody wants to change either. And so you look into the future, and it's just the way it is. Or for some of you, it's with your kids. You did your best to raise them right, but they went their own way. They got into the wrong things, wasted a bunch of years, and and it is what it is, and it's not going to change anytime soon. Or for some of you, it's financially. Your financial dreams aren't coming true. Your career isn't working out. And now there's nothing you can do about it. It looks permanent. It looks like there's no going back. It is what it is. For some of you, it's a health issue. you got something that's debilitating and chronic, and, and the doctor says it's not going away. They can treat it, but they can't cure it. And it's your new reality. And you look into the future with all these things, and And your future is different than what you hoped it would be. You're having a what next moment. What do I do now? This is not something I can fix. It's not something I can change. What next? Now, as we continue in this series, I want to remind you of something we've said before in the series, that the people who brought us the New Testament, the people that wrote down the Gospels about Jesus, the people that wrote the letters that make up the epistles or the other books of the New Testament... These are people who lived with constant difficulties. Their lives were full of problems and pain. And in fact, if we look at their lives compared to our lives today, their lives were on a whole different level of difficulty from anything that any of us face. And yet, these were men and women who continued to believe in God's goodness and kindness. And they kept their faith and they grew in faith because for them there was no conflict. There was no contradiction between a faithful God and a difficult life. They didn't struggle the way many people struggle today with this idea, well, if there's a good God, then good things should always happen for me. And because good things aren't happening for me, well, there must not be a good God. No, they didn't struggle with that. You don't find that idea in the New Testament or Old Testament. They seem to understand something about God that we have a hard time getting today. I went to Israel last year. It was an amazing trip. In fact, it was so amazing that I decided I want to take Kathy back. So in April of 2019, we're going to be going back. And in fact, if if you want to go to Israel... You can come talk to me. I'll tell you about the tour that we're going to be taking and the cost and whatever else you want to know. Uh, It's not cheap, but I think it's well worth it. But the reason I tell you that is when I was walking around on the streets of Jerusalem and I was seeing the, the places where the disciples hung out in Jerusalem, the stories of the Bible, of course, became more real to me than ever. But I also became more aware of the difficulties that they faced and the persecution and the trials and the rejection and the hatred toward believers in the early church. And you realize more than ever how the people whose stories we read in the New Testament faced more and bigger problems than you can even imagine. And yet... They continued, and they continued, and they continued to believe and to put their confidence in God. How in the world did they do that? Well, I want to talk today about one word that the New Testament authors, and Jesus in particular, re-emphasized over and over and over again. When we find ourselves in these kind of difficult or painful seasons of life, we are told to believe. Now, not just believe in Jesus. There's something very specific that we are told to believe, and the reason we're commanded to believe this is because we typically don't believe this when we're in difficult seasons of life. In fact, left to our own, we often think just the opposite. And yet, beginning with Jesus and the apostles, over and over and over again, we're told when we face difficulties, when we're in a difficult season of life, and it seems like this is just our new reality and it's not going to get any better, there's something very specific that we are told to believe. 
We find this in several places in the New Testament. I'm just going to look at one today. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of James. Now, a little Bible quiz here. Who wrote the letter that we call James? Okay, James. Yeah, I, I know all of you wanted to shout that out because you immediately know. I was just seeing if you're paying attention. Um, all right. And James had a very famous brother whose name was Jude. He, he was famous because the Beatles sang about him. Okay. It's true, his brother was Jude, but it's not because the people will sing about him. It's because he wrote one of the books in the Bible, too. Uh, and as you all knew, James' other brother was Jesus. Okay, so I was just kind of tricking you there a little bit. But uh, Jesus, after he was born, uh, Mary and Joseph had several other children. We're, uh, Matthew tells us the name of four brothers, including James and Jude, uh, but he also had some sisters as well. And James was not a disciple. He wasn't following Jesus around with the other disciples. He, he wasn't listening to Jesus' teaching. We never read about him at all in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It wasn't until after the crucifixion and the resurrection, after Pentecost, when thousands of people started to follow Jesus, that's when we start to hear about Jesus, James. And James became the leader of the early church in the city of Jerusalem, and he suffered enormously because of his faith in his brother. And so James tells us, if you're going through a tough time, if you're in one of these what next kind of circumstances, there's something you have to believe. So let's look at James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Here's what he says. James, a servant of God, okay, we understand that, servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking about his brother, as his Lord. Now think about, if you have a brother, what would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the Son of God? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, there ain't no way on earth that would ever happen. I, you, you could do all the miracles you want. You could walk on water from here to Hawaii. You could feed 5,000 people with a hot dog and a dill pickle. It wouldn't matter. There's no way you're going to convince me. And yet James came to the conclusion that his brother was the Son of God. What convinced him? It wasn't the teaching of Jesus because he didn't hear it, except secondhand later on. It wasn't the miracles of Jesus because he didn't see them. It wasn't the crucifixion of Jesus. It was the resurrection of Jesus. After the resurrection is when James comes to the forefront, he becomes a follower and then a leader in the church. Well, James continues writing, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. And he's probably primarily writing to Jewish Christians who by this time have scattered around the world because of all the persecution they're facing. And in verse 2, he starts with the hard part. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, this is where you and I go, Okay, I am not doing that. That is just silly. Rejoice when you run into huge problems? I don't think so. Well, before you reject everything James has to say, let's give him a chance and listen to why he would tell us to do this silly thing. Okay? James says, consider it. And I'm going to talk about a few Greek words this this morning. Uh, If if you're not familiar with that, the the New Testament was originally written in Greek, so sometimes when it's translated, we don't quite get the meaning of some of these words, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a few. The Greek word that we translate as consider is so interesting. It means to embrace or adopt. And he's basically saying that when bad things happen, When you're in a bad mood, when you feel like quitting and you feel like taking it out on someone else, you feel like withdrawing, when bad things happen, James says, I want you to try something different. I want you to embrace or adopt a different attitude toward your problems. Instead of considering it terrible, instead of considering it's the end of the world and my life will never be the same and I'll never be happy again, I want you to consider embracing and adopting it as a source of of something good. Now, we could all raise our hand and say, well, you know, Ken, that might be okay for somebody else and their problems, but you've got to hear my story. There's no way this applies to me. 
But James says, hold on, hold on, I'm not done yet. He says, I want you to consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face. And the Greek word face is also interesting. It's the word used when you have something bad take you by surprise. Maybe like a, a robbery that took you by surprise. I was reading the news on my iPhone a, a few days ago, and I read about this clown in Florida who attempted to rob a Little Caesars pizza manager late at night. Maybe you heard the story or, or saw it on the news. But uh, the, the manager was closing up about 1130 at night. He, he sets the alarm. He walks out the door. And then you can actually see on the security camera this, uh, this guy in a clown mask whaps him over the head with a two-by-four and then gets on top of him and tries to, to start stabbing him with scissors. And so this little Caesars manager was definitely surprised by a bad problem. Unfortunately, the uh, clown didn't realize that the manager of the store had a concealed carry permit. And so while the guy's trying to stab him with scissors, he manages to get his pistol out of his holster, shot the guy four times, and now the clown is dead. So he was definitely surprised by a bad problem, too. And the point is that this word James uses is the word for when you get a bad surprise. You're not expecting it. You're just kind of going along doing your own thing, you know, paying attention to your own business, and boom, there's a bad problem that whaps you over the head with a two-by-four. And James says when something takes you by surprise, instead of assuming the worst, I want you to think about your difficulties differently, and I want you to consider it as possibly the source of something good. And then he starts to give us the reason behind this. Because you know that the testing of your faith... Now, let's stop there again for a second, because this is so important. James is telling us something that we already kind of know, that that we already kind of suspected. This is no big surprise. He's telling us that whenever you hit a bump in life, it tests your faith. It tests your trust in God. In, In fact, the trials put your faith on trial, don't they? There's a sense in which your trials put God on trial because trials make us look at that situation and go, really, God? Really? You know, God, I've been trying to follow you and and I've been a good person. I've been a good husband, a good wife. and, And are you kidding me, God? After I'm doing all that, you allow this to happen to me? And James acknowledges, he says, you know, that the testing of your faith. He's saying, you know these bad circumstances you're in? You, you know they're a test of your faith, right? You know that, don't you? You know these problems? They're a test of your faith. You know these, this season of life is a test of your faith. You know that, right? And so the question is, do you really believe? And will you continue to, to believe? Trials test our confidence in God, don't they? And then James tells us the testing your faith produces something. It produces perseverance. Trials produce persevering faith. That's the ultimate point he's making here. Trials produce persevering faith. And when you read the New Testament, especially the teachings of Jesus, here's what you discover. God honors and God is most glorified by persevering faith. It's a particular kind of faith, persevering faith. Let me say that again. God honors and God is most glorified by persevering faith. Now, here's the deal. All of us love the kind of faith where God always says yes. We love the kind of faith where, you know, a, a miracle happens, you know, after we pray and somebody gets healed or I get a check in the mail or my kids gets an A on the test or the lost dog gets found and, and we say, well, I prayed in faith and it happened. Praise God. We love that kind of faith. Everybody wants more of that kind of faith. But nobody wants the faith that James is talking about right here. Nobody wants persevering faith because in order to get persevering faith, You have to persevere, which means you have to go through a bunch of problems. And so I don't want that kind of faith. I want the kind of faith that always gets a yes from God. I I prayed on Thursday and on Friday I got the raise. Praise God, you know. Or, you know, I lost my job on Monday and and, and then I, I 
prayed and fasted, and on Wednesday I got an even better one. Woohoo, God is so good. You know, we want that kind of faith. And I'm just like you. You know, I love the, to see God do good things in my life and answer my prayers and meet my needs and, I, and bless me and heal me. I love all those kind of things. But think for a minute if God was always like that. If God always answered yes, what would be the results in our life? Well, everybody around us would, would want to know the formula, wouldn't they? I want to know the right words to pray. I want to know the secret to always getting blessed like you're getting blessed. You know, what's the formula? And we'd all be in love with the formula and not with God. We'd all uh, want to find the secret to the formula and to get the cool stuff that God does for us. And we wouldn't be in love with God himself. We wouldn't want to honor and love God. We just want to get all the benefits that he gives us. And so God says, let me tell you what honors me the most. It's the person that believes anyway. It's the person that trusts me anyway. It's the person that perseveres anyway. God honors and God is most glorified by persevering faith. That's why James says, okay, when the, the bottom falls out and things are tough, before you go into a nosedive, before you hit the jet button and just give up on God, before you quit praying, before you tear up your Bible, before you quit going to that church, just wait a minute and think about, is it possible God is up to something good? And then James answers the question, what is God up to? And he tells us God is up to developing persevering faith now you don't enjoy getting persevering faith because it's painful learning it i don't enjoy getting persevering faith because it's painful learning it but persevering faith is the kind of faith that honors god most and then james gets to the main point this is the thing that he really wants us to take away he doesn't want us to just somehow start seeing bad things as good things no he wants there to be an impact on your life. And so he says this, let perseverance finish its work. Let perseverance finish its work. In other words, God is at work in you. God is up to something. God is in the process of building in you the kind of faith that honors him most. The the kind of faith that, that actually amazes other people when they see it in you. So let perseverance finish its work. There's a sense in which as you think about the greatest tension in your life right now, and it could be with a a son or a daughter or a grandchild, it could be in your marriage, it could be financially or with your boss or with your health, as you think about the thing that's got you worried, it's at the top of your prayer list, you're stressed out about it, your greatest tension right now in life is the place where God wants to work in your life. Your biggest stress point right now, that's the place where he wants to finish his work in you so that you will be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. But you have to allow him by choosing to believe that God is up to something good. The area of your life that is painful and and you wouldn't wish it on anybody and you wish you could go back and somehow change it and undo it, that's the area where God wants to work powerfully in your life if you let him by allowing perseverance to finish its work because if you do at the end of the process your persevering faith is going to bring more honor to god and it's going to make you a better person and in fact that's what james talks about next he goes on to say let perseverance finish its works so that you may be mature and complete. How do I become a mature Christian? You allow perseverance to finish its work. Uh, Ken, isn't there an easier way? You know, uh, no. Well, what if I memorize a bunch of scripture? Well, that's good. You know, that, that'll make you smart, but it won't make you mature. Well, what if I obey all the commandments and all the laws? Well, that's good. That'll make you obedient. But it won't make you mature. And in fact, there's a really cool thing going on in this uh, verse here. If we go to the next slide, you'll uh, see a little input on it. The Greek word that we translate as finish and the Greek word we translate as mature are exactly the same word. 
If you're reading the Greek, he repeats the same word twice in that sentence. One time we translate it finished, one time mature. But they're both the same word. And so, and the word that we actually translate as complete also means complete, even though it's a different Greek word, but, but it means complete in every part, as in completely complete. And I know this is really confusing, but here's what James is literally saying. Let perseverance complete its work so that you will be completely complete. That's what it literally says in that verse. In other words, if you don't allow perseverance to complete its work, then you will never be complete. If you don't allow perseverance to mature you, you will never be mature. You won't be mature. You won't be complete. You will be lacking something. You see, what James is telling us, and, and we all kind of know this already, and we, we don't really like it, but we know it. What we all know is that there's something about perseverance that makes you stronger. There's something about perseverance that makes you deeper. There's something about perseverance that makes your story more attractive. And in fact, how many great stories have you heard about people who persevered despite overwhelming odds or or crushing difficulties, and they finally made it, and, and then we look at them as heroes. We love stories like that, right? We just don't want our story to be like that, because that's too hard. That's too painful. You see, the truth is, and you find this throughout the Scripture, not just in James. The truth is that spiritual maturity is always measured in terms of persevering faith, not perfect behavior. Persevering faith, not perfect behavior. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Have you ever met a a Christian that just seemed so good that they were actually kind of sickening? Now, we don't have, you know, many people like that around here. But th- these people are like, well, I would never do that. And, and I always pray three hours a day. And, and I'm never tempted with any, uh, you know, temptation. I'm always perfect. And, you know, I, I, I can't think of anybody like that in our church right now. So don't worry about this. But, but uh, we did have someone here. Um, this lady used to come up to me uh, after church, and she would tell me how, uh, you know, she is already doing everything perfectly that I talked about in the sermon, and she never has any problems with that. And, and you know, it, it, she was so perfect. It was really annoying. And I always wondered, actually, if she was so perfect, why she was on her second marriage. But I never dared to ask her that. I'm not quite that stupid. And don't get me wrong. I love purity. I love morality and and devotion to God. I love those things. But if you act like it, if you act like you're perfect, I'm probably going to want to hang around with somebody else because I'm not perfect. And, you know, I'll just admire you from a distance, okay? But we don't have many people like that in the, the vineyard. We have more of the people who are a little rough around the edges because they don't use Sunday school language all the time, maybe. And, and, but God has changed their life so much and taken them through so many huge challenges that now their confidence in God is so deep that you just kind of love to be around them. And they say things like, well, I would never want to go through that again. But God used it in my life, and and he changed me, and I learned so much, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And you're amazed not by their obedience. You're amazed not by their Bible knowledge. You're amazed by the depth of their confidence in God because of what they've gone through. You know how they got that faith and, and that confidence? They allowed perseverance to finish its work. And yes, they're obedient. And yes, they learn the Scripture. But their maturity comes from the fact that they've gone through difficult stuff and they allowed perseverance to finish its work. Not because they acted perfect, but because in the middle of the valley they said, God, I am going to trust you anyway. And what God does in the life of a man or woman who stays there and allows perseverance to finish its work is inspiring. Now, James keeps writing, and you can tell James is a realist. He, he knows what we're thinking. He's, he knows we're like a, a James. 
I don't really like all this talk about trials and tribulations and testing your faith and perseverance. Can't we talk about prayer or something else? Can't we talk about how, how God loves to bless everybody? And if I'm just obedient, I'm guaranteed blessings. If I just give money, I'm, I'm guaranteed to get lots of money back. Can't we talk about those kind of things? And James is like, well, I don't know what kind of God you're talking about, but, but it's not the God I know. But James knows how he think. And, and so he's, he's so practical. In verse 5 he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. If any of you lacks, lacks wisdom, which is really going to be all of us, because when we get that call from the doctor, or we get that bad news, or we're, or we're surprised with bad news about our kids, whatever it is, when we're in that difficult time, we all lack wisdom about how to handle it. We all need to ask God for his wisdom. And and when you're surprised by bad news of any kind, the first thing you do is, God, I need some wisdom from you. Like, what the heck is going on? I just heard this bad news, God, and and I don't want to quit believing. I don't want to run away. I don't want to hit the eject button. I don't want to do something stupid or do just the easy thing. God, I need wisdom. What is wisdom? It's very simple. It's the ability to see as God sees. The ability to see as God sees. God, I don't understand this question, I, 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 this situation. I, I got surprised by bad news. I don't even know how to react to this. So give me wisdom. Give me the ability to see it as you see it. God, I'm, I'm ticked off at this person, I, 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 but I'll bet if I saw her the way you saw her, I wouldn't be mad. And, and so give me the ability to see as you see. God, I'm frustrated with this situation, but, but I bet if I saw the situation as you do, I wouldn't be frustrated. So give me the ability to see it as you see it. And so James says, consider it pure joy when you have all kinds of things that take you by surprise and sneak up on you and wreck your plans and ruin your dreams. And in the midst of it, you allow perseverance to do something inside of you. And when you get really frustrated, when you get confused, you say, God, I need wisdom. I need to see this the way that you see it so that I can respond in a way that honors you. But James is not done yet. He adds a but. But when you ask for wisdom, you must believe, (coughs) excuse me, believe and not doubt. When you ask God, And you tell them, God, this took me by surprise. I don't like this. I don't see any way forward. I don't see any way out. I I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how I'm going to relate. God, I need wisdom to see as as you see. He says, but when you ask, you've got to believe. Believe what? You've got to believe that God is up to something. You've got to believe that there is a bigger plan. You've got to believe that there is a personal God who cares for you. He says, when you ask, you can't doubt. Believe and don't doubt. Why? Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Now, some teachers think that this might have been kind of a, a fun little jab at Peter. Because you remember the story of Peter? You know, Peter's on, in the boat, and he sees Jesus walking on the water, right? And the, the, the wind is, is up, and it's blowing and tossing everybody. And, and yet G, uh, Peter says, you know, Jesus is walking on the water. I, I want to do that. Jesus, can I, can I walk on the water? And Jesus says, yeah, come on out. And so uh, Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking on the water. But then he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he starts to sink, right? And I think the other disciples probably teased him about that for the rest of his life. Like, hey, Peter, remember the time when you went swimming? And Peter's going like, well, I didn't see any of you bozos getting out of the boat. But here's the point, and this is really the key to everything that we're talking about. I've got to believe that there is a faithful God who is up to something. That's really what it's all about. When life is hard and problems come, I've got to believe that there is a faithful God who is up to something. And James says the one who doubts is the person that takes their eyes off of the fact that there is a faithful God who is up to something. And that's when you start to sink. 
And so he says, you can't doubt, you can't take your eyes off the fact that there's a faithful God who is up to something. Because if you take your eyes off of that, then you're going to put your eyes on to your circumstances. And if you put your eyes on your circumstances, then it's going to undermine your faith. You're going to start sinking under those waves, and you're not going to allow perseverance to finish its work. So James says, if you doubt, that person should not expect to receive anything, talking about wisdom, from the Lord. And so to put this all together, here's what James is saying. He's saying, when you're surprised by problems, when the bottom drops out and and you didn't expect it, you didn't deserve it, when things change, it wasn't your idea, you got that phone call, that letter, you got the bad news at work, and suddenly, through no fault of your own, your world is upside down. James says, don't assume the worst. Don't assume that God has forgotten you. Don't assume that he doesn't care. He says, it's time to change your way of thinking and reconsider Reconsider what? Reconsider that God is planning something good for you. He's planning for how you can become mature and complete. Something good can come from this. God is building your faith. But in order for that to happen, in order for perseverance to finish its work, I've got to believe there is a faithful God who is up to something. Now, that sounds so simple, right? except for the fact that my tendency is to believe that God isn't doing anything or that God doesn't care about it or or God's lost track of it or God's punishing me or God hasn't been keeping good records of just how good I've been. And, And James says, no. You need to believe that God is at work and that he is at work in you. And what is he doing in you? He's working in you to mature you, to create persevering faith. I've got to believe there is a faithful God who is up to something. I heard one guy say it this way, you endure to mature. You endure to mature. And the key is that maturity is not about how much you know. That just makes you smart, which is good, but that's not maturity. And maturity is not about how obedient you are. You know, it's, it, that just makes you good, and, and being good is good. But that's not maturity. Maturity comes when bad things happen, and you choose to believe anyway. You allow perseverance to finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete. I'd like the worship band to come up for a closing song. As they come up, On your bulletin, there's a short prayer that I want to encourage you to pray each day this week. Just take it home and it's on the next slide if we can go to that. Take it home and stick it on your refrigerator or next to TV remote or in your iPad or or someplace you see it every day. Pray this prayer. Think about the problem or situation you've been going through. The thing that you've been praying for God to change, but he hasn't changed yet. And then pray this. Heavenly Father, I believe that you will use this until you choose to remove this. Grant me the wisdom to see as you see and the strength to do as you say. In fact, let's all pray that out loud together right now. Ready? Heavenly Father, I believe you will use this until you choose to remove this. Grant me the wisdom to see as you see and the strength to do as you say. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we think about our difficult circumstances, we believe that right now, in the middle of our greatest tension, is your biggest opportunity. And so we invite you right now, Lord, to do what you need to do in us. Father, we are choosing not to run, not to give up, not to withdraw. Instead, we're choosing to allow perseverance to finish its work in us. And so would you give each of us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've just heard and the courage and the strength to do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.